Oh, just the other night, separate but equal in the movie, and there was a uh, handsome guy. Handsome guy portraying William Coleman before a group yeah. of Thurgood Marshall and fellow yeah. attorneys. Uh, did that happen? Were you, in fact, you sort of did a game plan of who the, you know, what the justices were possibly thinking? Well, they, we certainly, there were times when we tried by reading a lot of their opinions and a few of us had known some of them to figure out how they would react uh, and what's the best way to appeal to them. And you also, well, Mr. Marshall certainly felt that sometime you lose a case because you say something the wrong way. And therefore, it, you know, like this whole question of, of when you're trying to integrate the school system or desegregate, but we soon felt that desegregate made more sense than integrate. It didn't seem to be as much affirmative action that you were trying to take. And uh, we were well aware that uh, uh, the mood of the country, after all, you had just uh, not so long ago uh, finished uh, a World War. And during that war, uh, most of the armed forces, uh, certainly to the beginning of the Truman administration, were segregated. Uh, I kind of smiled today when they talked mainly about, well, it was a problem of the South, whereas you recognize that most major northern cities or a lot of places in, in the country were as segregated as the South. Uh, it may not be a statute which says you went in jail if you went someplace, mm -hmm. but certainly there was as much segregation. What did you learn today? You sat there and listened to the... Well, it was fascinating by watching awfully bright, able young man uh, talk about how the court struggled with what everybody thought was a very difficult issue. Uh, in retrospect, I think most people would say that somehow the court had to make a decision which would uh, either outlaw racial segregation or at least uh, put it greatly under suspect uh, that uh, the country was changing, you know, you had television, you had everything, and I don't think that you could really say the United States could continue to survive. Uh, and that was fascinating. I had never known about the uh, collection they made of, with respect to all of the uh, cities and how school system works and everything. I wish that uh, we could have participated in that because we could have given them, I think, some good, good advice. Uh, and uh, the other thing that kept on reoccurring to me is to say, well, can I in good conscience say that what the court did was correct, what the law clerks were thinking about was correct, and that was the way to do it in 1954. But today, knowing the problems that we still have in the society, though they're different, whether if certain things had been done in a different way then, uh, would we be better off today? And that's uh, something which is the intriguing. The uh, you know, country certainly has improved. Uh, it's uh, you know, much better under almost any circumstances they indicated. But on the other hand, there's still a lot of problem, and I sometimes way knowing, for example, that with respect to women, well, women didn't get the right to vote until long after the 15th Amendment was passed. Uh, when I was law clerk to Justice Frankfurter, uh, we wrote an opinion of Justice Frankfurter, I think the court decided six to three, that a statute which says a woman couldn't work in a bar unless the bar was owned by her husband or father was constitutional. Obviously, today that statute would clearly be unconstitutional. And yet, and also knowing then that when I went to the Harvard Law School in 1941, that uh, it was no, no women, and indeed, or you couldn't even bring one in on a date on Saturday. Uh, and now, the dean of the Harvard Law School is a woman. Right. And jazzly, I would certainly say that the 
women have become lawyers, and you'll find many more of them in powerful positions in these major law firms than you do blacks. Well, under those circumstances, why the difference? Uh, particularly when, if you look at it, women started after we did. I mean, after we, in theory, the 14th Amendment certainly applied to us even more than it did to women. But yet today, I would say the women have been more successful in trying to break down all the barriers that, that men have, than black men have. Sure. You joined with Felix Frankfurter in 1948. 48. 48 How did that happen? Well, I had uh, clerked a year for uh, uh, Judge Goodrich on the Third Circuit, and then one day uh, Henry Hart, who was a professor at the Harvard Law School, who I don't think I ever took a course from, called me up and asked me whether I'd like to be Justice Frankfurter's law clerk the next year. And I'd met Justice Fra Frankfurter because he'd come up to the law school to some of the law review dinners. And obviously I said yes. And he hung the phone up and I never heard uh, any more about, about it. You know, no interview, no nothing. And I finally, a good friend of mine at the law school, uh, Professor Paul Fraun, who I had taken courses under, uh, I called him and he said, well, gee, I better call Henry Hart and see what happened. And he called Henry Hart and uh, uh, apparently Henry Hart said, gee, Paul, that Coleman is not as bright as you said he was, that I assume that once I asked him, he said yes, that he knew it was a close deal. <laughs> <laughs> and so he called me back and said, you know, I'm supposed to report work on the 1st of September. And then I got a call about the same time from Elliot Richardson, who had clerked, been clerking for Learned Hand, and he was going to be the other clerk. And so I, so that's how I got to be just ready. I think, well, I'd been, but Paul Front had been very nice to me, and I had been very successful in the two courses I took from him. And I had uh, finished first in my class, so therefore I think that it's one of those things that just happened. Was there any sense of history there? Well, uh, I, I would, you know, I guess in retrospect you say, I mean, after all, Washington was still a segregated city then. Uh, I remember there was one day when we were working and the court uh, was not open, but the justices were working. It's one of those semi-holiday, but the lunchroom at the court was closed. And I was working on an antitrust case with Justice Frankfurt, and Elliot stuck his head in the door and said, the law clerks have decided to go down to the Mayflower for, uh, for lunch. Uh, and I said, well, give me 10 minutes, I'll join you. So when I came out 10 minutes later, Elliot said, oh, gee, it's kind of late, let's go down to the Union Station. And I went just thinking that, you know, we, we were late. I then got back to the office and I had noticed that the justice had tears in his eyes. <laughs> I forget why. Because Elliot had told him the story that he called the Mayflower, and the Mayflower said, well, we can't take a black. And so, you know, Frankfurter certainly felt very offended at that. Uh, uh, and uh, on the other hand, I had a you know, good time because, uh, uh, I, you know, I certainly socialized with the other law clerks, uh, and uh, Frankfurter had a lot of people in. so. I just felt, but you know, life was different then. Yeah. And, uh, but I just, of course, I had, a, had had a great mother and father, and uh, they just felt that, uh, that this was something that had to change. Uh, also, that uh, they spent uh, a lot of time talking about people who had been, you know, strikingly successful in the world, uh, even though they were black. Uh, I think I knew about uh, uh, Pushkin, the great Russian writer, before I knew about some of the great American writers, because mm -hmm. my mother and father, and Pushkin, most Americans don't realize, was black, and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also the Dumas brothers and father, I knew about them, and I knew about the Queen of, Queen of, uh, what, Queen, Queen of Sheba, whatever it is, and the rest of them. So I, you know, just had had two cent overture. So we had, an, and then I, you know, had 
come up under a situation and my great great grandfather on my uh, mother's side fought uh, with Grant at Lookout Mountain and you know so I've so uh, and they operated the Underground Railroad out of St. Louis, Missouri. So I, you know we had just had uh, and my mother was uh, Thurgood Marshall was born in the house right next to where my mother lived. So I you know so we had had just a different experience. You come on to court in 1948, uh, talking about some of the personalities of some of the judges. What did you know about Robert Jackson? Well, he was obviously one that Mr. Justice Frankfurt admired very much. Uh, he was uh, awfully good. Uh, I, the, I think the general consensus was that he was probably the best uh, uh, writer on the court. Uh, uh, on the other hand, by that time, there had been uh, some of the tension between uh, Black and uh, uh, Mr. Justice Jackson, uh, and uh, there had been some controversy about him going to Nuremberg and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, also, it was clear that Douglas thought that maybe he would be the president <laughs> states that he knew that Jackson would, perhaps would be so there was you know there was that tension but he was greatly respected uh, uh, wrote quite well and had a tremendous personality uh, and I had uh, actually at the law school uh, uh, one of my classmates he's also in the law review was Bill Jackson although I don't think anybody knew that uh, uh, the justice was Bill Jackson's father until maybe the end of his time. He's on the law review. Something came up, and somebody said, "Oh, geez, is that your father?" He said, "Yes," but he was very quiet. Never mentioned it. Never talked about it. Did you have any personal interaction with Justice Jackson? Oh yeah, things were different then, in the sense that uh, uh, oft times, if you were walking down the hall, a justice would ask you to come in to see him. Uh, and he also, one of his law clerk, I think, was uh, was Jim Marsh, one of his law clerks. Jim Marsh. Yeah, yeah. Well, from Philadelphia, I knew him, uh, and so I would go and see Jim, and we'd argue and talk about issues. And uh, he was, you know, he'd treat you like you were one of his law clerks. And he and Frankfurt were very close, so a lot. So I, I, I saw a lot of him. But, well, you know. I, uh, he never asked me to go out and have a drink with him, something, but we we associated a lot together. What about uh, relationships of Frankfurter and Hugo Black, or Frankfurter and Douglas? Well, uh, well, Frankfurter and Douglas, they hardly spoke to each other. I mean, that was a, by the time I got there, it was a terrible relationship uh, with uh, uh, Hugo Black, uh, they always were very friendly uh, and respected each other. I mean, they disagreed <coughs> sometime, you know, the, the fight on whether you uh, incorporate the first eight amendments and the 14th Amendment. I mean, that was something that Frankfurter thought was not right and had those things. But they, they had great. And, and I remember one time I was walking down and just as Black saw me and took me into uh, his uh, office to try to convince me on some uh, matter that that he was right and Frankfurt was wrong, and I, and as he spelled it out, I said, "Gee, Mr. Justice uh, Black, if you would repeat everything you said slowly, you will convince yourself you're wrong." <laughs> At which point, uh, Black said, "Gee, you better go back to see Frankfurt," and apparently Frankfurt the next day said, "Gee." I talked to Justice Black, and he said, "Gee, that Coleman is a really a very relaxed young man." <laughs> you know, so, so we got, you know, and also you know, Black had a very good law clerk. Uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, oh, come on. Uh, his father was a judge in uh, in Alabama. He went on to be a judge. Truman Hobbs. No, his father was on the was a congressman who who wrote the Tru the Hobbs something bill. Uh, and so we, we, I knew Truman very well, and uh, and also, well, Lou Pollock, I knew he, he clerked for uh, 
uh, Rutledge, and so we, you know, we got together. But it was completely different than it is today. I mean, you know, you really went and you, you know, you talk to each other and you try to rewrite part of people's opinion and that sort of thing. After uh, clerking, then you end up with Paul Weiss. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, just to show you once again, I believe it or not, uh, I was born in Philadelphia, grew up in Philadelphia, went to school in Philadelphia. I finished summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania. I was magna cum laude for Harvard, first in my class, uh, and I had clerk for Judge Goodrich in Frankfurt, and I couldn't get a job in Philadelphia. I mean, no Philadelphia firm would hire me. You know, you name it, Morgan Lewis, all the big firm, uh, and uh, I, uh, I, well, what had happened two years before when I had finished, well, what, well, I was in my last year of law school, and the Law Review had a dinner, and I was sitting next to Elliot Richardson, and Elliot uh, said, gee, where are you going to work next year, Bill? I said, I don't know. I, nobody's off the job yet. And so I got a call from Elliot's uh, uncle, a guy named Henry Shattuck, who a very distinguished Bostonian, who was in the city council. Uh, but he knew a guy named Curtis, who was head of one of the big firms in, in uh, Boston, very liberal, and at the time was in the state legislature, Talk about how you have to have sewer rights and everything. So he picked up the phone to call Charlie Curtis and said, gee, I got a wonderful young man that my, my, my nephew says he's a great law student, and said, and I take it at the end, he said, oh, and the fact that he happens to be color, I'm pretty sure that doesn't make a difference. At which point Curtis said, oh, gee, I don't think in Boston we could do that. But I have a friend in New York, Lloyd Garrison, uh, and he's in Paul Weiss, we could go into Garrison, and I'll call him, and they, and so that's how I got to Paul Weiss. But, uh, but then I got the job at Goodrich, so I didn't do it in Frankfurt, and then I finally did it. But for three years, I commuted every day from F Philadelphia to New York by train and oh practiced law, and then I would sometime, you know, go down and work with Thurgood Marshall, and I did that. How did but, that happen? Huh? How did you connect? Was that something Paul Weiss encouraged? Or oh, no, 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 but Marshall just called me one day. Well, well, see, when I was a law clerk, he had argued a couple of cases, and he, you know, he saw me where the clerks sit, and so he just called me. Oh, then it must have been about eight months after I started working at Paul Weiss, and said, we're thinking about having an all-out attack on, on uh, school segregation. And we'd like to come down and discuss it. And well, sometime in June, oh gee, that must have been, see, that'd be, that'd be about June 50 or 51. And I went down, and about 40 of us at Paul Fern was there, some other people there. And so that's how it started, and we finally selected where to file the cases, what to do. And then I would work with him at the night, the weekend, and we uh, went. Uh, we had two, two, two stories that I'll be finished. One, the day we was, but we stayed at the Wardman Park Hotel, which was a nice hotel. And so we got in the cab, and a guy takes us to the Supreme Court. And he says, when we got to the Supreme Court, he said, you know, when you gentlemen got in the cab, you never told me where you were going. But Mr. Bosch, I knew where you had to be. So that's how we got to court. This was the argument day. For the the argument. This is the argument day, and it's the first argument. And we, we, you know, we're so excited we didn't mention it. The other one is about a, a week before the argument, no, about two weeks before the argument, and we were at the Warman Park Hotel every night, and along about 7 o'clock this guy would knock on the door and bring us a cake. Uh, and the night before the argument he comes back and he Asked to see if it brings a cake. He said, Mr. Marshall, can you get me a seat tomorrow in the court? Because <laughs> I want to hear the argument. And of course, Mr. Marshall says, Well, I don't know. After all, I got to get Walter White in. I got to get Roy Wilkins up here. I don't think I can. So the guy comes back by an hour later. He said, That's all right, Mr. Marshall. You don't have to worry. 
So we get to court the next day, we're sitting there, and we have to look over, you know, where the judges, guests are. This guy sit on the first row. It happens to be uh, the Chief Justice's valet. <laughs> Nope. And he was aware, I'm pretty sure if Mrs. Uh, Warren had been making these cakes, because they lived in Warby Park Hotel too, had been sending us these cakes every day. <laughs> so, so, yeah. uh, uh, and I, and, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, had uh, that experience I had, which I always thought was kind of funny. <laughs> oh, my God. That's great yeah. right behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I look forward to, to chat, listening tonight, and I, I said I'd yeah. take you for 20 minutes. And okay, you kept your word. Yeah, well, if you ever get to Washington, drop by here. We, well, we'll certainly make yeah. a point of that. Mm -hmm. But thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, well, thank you.